Welcome to the Invisible Capital Podcast with PitchBook, where we shine a light on the traditionally opaque private markets. Here are your hosts, Adley Bowden and Adam Lewis. Welcome everyone to PitchBook's Invisible Capital Podcast. We're devoting season one to examining the private markets by discussing the work of PitchBook analysts and writers during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Adam Lewis, a private equity reporter for the PitchBook newsletter, and I'll be joined today by Adley Bowden, our head of editorial and our institutional research group, along with emerging tech analyst, Paul Condra. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thanks, Adam. This is Adley. Looking forward to a uh, great discussion today. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Paul, let's just start uh, by giving us a little bit of your background and uh, what your role is here at PitchBook. My name is Paul Condra, and I am the uh, lead analyst on our emerging technology team. And we are a team that focuses primarily on venture-backed technology, writing about where VCs are putting their money and what kind of technological bets they're making and identifying um, you know, different areas of investment in that space and talking about the companies that are getting funded. It's a little bit different from what I was doing previously, but still in the investment space. I spent most of my career in equity research, so working at an investment bank covering uh, public equities. Uh, my last role was at Credit Suisse covering fintech. Um, and I think that kind of work is a bit more structured because public companies provide a lot of data and investors are looking for very specific things to make investments in those companies. Um, what we're doing with our emerging technology team at PitchBook is a little bit different. Um, a lot of these companies you know, don't provide public data. And so we're really trying to create a platform, create a research platform that helps our clients understand these businesses through the lens of a venture investor or potential investor um, You know, when you don't necessarily have the operating fundamental data of the company, but you're trying to look from a little bit more of an outside perspective. I just I can't go a little on any farther without you acknowledging your journalistic background before Credit Credit Suisse. Oh yeah, that was well, that was before before Credit Suisse. I was actually at uh, Bank of Montreal, and before that, um, I was doing journalism. Right, so I started out after college as a journalist, um, and I worked at the University of Washington Daily, as a matter of fact. Um, and then I had some small newspaper jobs after college before I kind of reoriented myself in some different directions, ended up at business school and got into equity research. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I'm sure you used some of that journalistic sense that you learned at the daily and maybe in some subsequent jobs to help write uh, one of your recent analyst notes called The Great Unlocationing, which I just read this morning, found it very, very interesting. And you were kind of early to this whole, I mean, you came out with this before we were all on lockdown. So nice call, uh, first of all. And secondly, what what is the great unlocationing? You know, I don't know if I actually was that early to it. I think we were working from home by the time that came out with. Okay. But, um, you know, obviously everyone working from home, you kind of think about whether this is a long term or short term uh, trend. And I think it's just an interesting it's a really interesting debate. And it's a lot of people are having these conversations about when we come back to the office and what do offices look like. But the point that I was really trying to make in this note was less about we're working from home and maybe we never will come back to the office and we were a business that was fully you know location based and now maybe we're going to have more people working from home and more about this idea that this could be a catalyst for new startups new companies to actually um proactively choose to be fully distributed as a strategic decision about how to run their business and so you know the idea being that there's probably going to be more appetite in the VC community now to invest in these kinds of businesses because if you were a an investor before this uh, in the technology space, most likely the companies you're owning now are fully distributed. Everybody's probably working from home, so you've hadn't got used to it very fast. Um, whereas maybe before you, you know, I think VCs really wanted to visit a startup's office and meet the team and see how everyone works together. Well, now if you're going to do deals in this environment or just support the companies you've already invested in. You have to kind of support the distributed infrastructure. So it's bringing a lot of investors to the table. And then I think looking at the benefits of being distributed, you know, structurally, like lower cost structure, there's recruiting advantages. Um, there's maybe morale advantages. Your, your employees can work forever they want and they have a kind of ultimate flexibility. So there could be some benefits to being uh, distributed. 
And so just this idea that, well, if we've got capital availability and we've got very entrepreneurial founders that are starting things fully distributed, there could be some uh, business models or some problems that these startups solve or bring unique solutions to because they're distributed. And they could have some like inherent benefits from the fact that they're distributed. And that kind of drives this virtuous cycle of investment, innovation, um, you know, on and on. And you have potentially this kind of class of distributed startups that become a little bit, uh, you know, disruptive, innovative in ways that a traditional location-based company cannot. So that's, that's, that's sort of the crux of the argument. It's a little more nuanced than just, you know, why don't we let more of our employees work from home now, take our sort of office-based culture and try to replicate it at home. This is more, let's just fully start in a distributed environment and really build our company with that mindset within that kind of framework. So are there some specific companies that are, you think, kind of building those building blocks? You know, Zoom is probably the the largest um, example of this, but what are some maybe of the more nascent ones that you've got your eye on? I mean, there's a couple um, VC back companies that are actually um, very, I, I would say successful in terms of still being um, either, either by being profitable or growing very fast. A couple of them I'll mention are GitLab and Zapier. They're both software companies. GitLab is a a software development platform and Zapier is a kind of a software integration platform. GitLab had a recently raised and, you know, has a $2.8 billion valuation now. Um, and Zapier's valuation is unknown. They, they haven't raised money since 2014, but they're, you know, re reportedly um, profitable and growing very fast. And, you know, there's just a lot of buzz about both of these companies and they were originally started as distributed organizations. And I think what's what's interesting is that at least the CEO of GitLab has been in some interviews said that plenty of investors have looked at his company before the pandemic and said um, that they didn't want to invest in a you know fully remote business. It was just something they couldn't get comfortable with. So, you know, there were there were there was capital that was kind of just deliberately choosing not to invest in that type of business. But, you know, what what these companies do is they kind of feed into the ecosystem of digital, remote, you know, things existing in the cloud, the ability to get your work done in a more automated kind of way, eliminating manual processes. So they're they're solving technology problems that are probably more likely to be felt by technology organizations. So, you know, they're really kind of feeding into that industry, that ecosystem of businesses that were technology oriented, uh, you know, finding new ways to do things in a remote setting. You know, I mean, I think like there's a lot of new companies also that are really focused on the whole virtual collaboration aspect of things. And you hear now about some companies looking at like virtual meeting rooms where you could be like a hologram sitting around a table. Like, I don't know if we're there yet. I don't know if the technology is there yet, but you know, we've, we even here at PitchBook, we're using a tool called Miro and that's a VC backed startup. And it's really interesting. All the designers can go onto this platform at once and start moving their cursors around together and making notes and drawing pictures and connecting things. And it's, you know, it, it looks like a bunch of little worker ants, like working together. And, you know, we have these processes where people sit in a room and they write things on sticky pads and they sit, they put it up on a board. And then we take pictures of those sticky pads and we try to like put them all together. Well, here, everyone's doing it in a digital platform from the start. And you can very easily just move those those kind of virtual sticky pads around. And I'll, and even though you don't have the face-to-face -face interaction, from a process perspective, I almost wonder if there's some advantages to doing things this way. Um, it just seems a little bit less cumbersome. you know. So there's obviously a lot of pushback about like, how do you replicate these aspects of the office culture that worked so well? And you know, maybe you can't, but if you if you never had that office culture, if you started remote from the, from the beginning and that was your mindset, um, you don't have to have that problem of replicating an office culture. You're you're solving all the things you need to do in a distributed fashion along the way. Um, and that's how I think it becomes innovative and potentially disruptive. Do you think there will be VCs, Paul, that basically, I mean, it sounds like this could become like an industry, like a work from home industry within itself. Do you think there'll be venture capital firms that just say, okay, we're just going to invest in like work from home startups. Like that's going to be our niche MO. I would, I mean, I would, I would definitely have a portfolio, you know, think that, think of allocating a segment of my portfolio to just that, 
you know, the way I outlined it in the report was more of a mega trend. I mean, it's not, it's not tomorrow. Every, I mean, we are all working from home right now, but most businesses are talking about how we get back in the office. There's definitely going to be a lot of businesses that say, um, how do we just stay out of the office and do things differently from the start? How do we start a business that doesn't need to be in the office? Which if you're, if you're a startup right now, you need to start a business that's not in the office. You know, that's, that's kind of how you need to innovate. So I, I, and, and if I'm a VC and I'm looking at two businesses right now and one of them, and they're kind of doing similar things on similar potential growth trajectories, and one of them is fully remote and one of them is waiting to get back into an office, well, I might prefer the distributed one because they're not, they're not burdened by this issue of having to get into the office. Um, and, you know, some business, some companies are talking about moving employees back, but realistically, it's going to be a year probably before everything's a hundred percent back online. We just had face Facebook just came out and said half our employees are going to be remote. Twitter has said, you don't ever have to come back. We're going to have a big, long um, opportunity here to really test how these distributed businesses work. And if I want to start a business, I have to do it that way. Um, and I also, if I'm a VC, I have to invest that way. I have to meet someone over zoom. So I, I think absolutely you'll have um, investors that just think about that as like, that could be a, operational um, choice that actually allows a business to be more competitive and more disruptive and more innovative. And I want to have some capital allocated to that, um, to that piece of things. The same way sort of coming out of um, the Great Recession, you said, you know, I want to have capital allocated to SaaS because SaaS looks disruptive right now. And you had incumbents saying, you know, Oracle, the famous one, right? Like saying, oh, SaaS is just, it's never really going to be a thing. And you you hear a lot of um, I think legacy businesses make the same comments today that say we can't replicate what we did in the office remotely. It just won't work. We have to go back to the office. And it's that mindset. That's when disruption happens, right? It's when you think something won't disrupt you or you dismiss it. You think that's not the way it's going to be. It just won't work. Um, and when people come along and say, we're just going to do it that way and innovate and find new ways to do it, that's when they end up with coming up with like kind of new, new ideas, new approaches, um, just new ways of thinking about things. And then at that point, when that starts working, those incumbents are now too late because they dismissed it. So, you know, I try to sit back and think about when I think about disruption, what are the things that are being dismissed? What are the things that the incumbents are just ignoring right now? Um, and when Disney or Kodak or, you know, when they all realized that digital was a real thing, they were suddenly too late to act. And every company that began as a digital organization had a huge head start. So, you know, it's it's an interesting narrative to tell. I mean, and and like I say in my report, I think it's like a mega trend. Like we don't know the answer a year from now. We don't know the answer two, three years from now. But ten years from now, um, it might be a really smart place to have made some big investments. Have you thought about trying to quantify the savings? I mean, certainly there's office space, which is a non insignificant cost, and especially the you know main venture centers. Um, I think I saw Facebook said they could would allow people to work remotely, but that they would re, like localize compensation. So you can't move to Topeka and pull a Bay Area uh, salary that they would try to do it. So you got savings there. Um, and then certainly your office perks, it's gotten a little wild in the tech space with, you know, unlimited kind bars and kombucha on tap right. and all that type <laughs> of stuff. So cold uh, maybe, brew. You're, yeah, cold, maybe you're given uh, yeah, employees stipends, you know, with the free <laughs> lunches and different things like that. So uh, it seems like, you know, especially from a burn rate for a venture company and this, you know, only really applies to tech. I mean, it's hard to see a services company or others, obviously, um, but there's functions, I suppose, in those companies that could. But there's potential significant savings. I mean, could this be to the paradigm shift that AWS was to having to spend your own rack, but just allow you to be way more capital efficient as a company? Uh, I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess like I haven't done like a a really full blown out model of it. But I do think, you know, we shouldn't blow it out of proportion. Like I, I, for a startup, office costs are probably pretty low. You don't need a whole lot of space and you're not oh. spending a lot on, on perks. WeWork's going to have to start making a profit again. So I don't know how. <laughs> yeah, WeWork's a bit <laughs> of an exception. You know, maybe when we were talking about like the later, you know, mid later stage um, startups that do have substantial footprints, that's when it becomes more meaningful. Yeah. Um, but for, for very early stage, you know, the savings are probably not tremendously significant. I think what's more impactful is the recruiting capability where you can say, you know, here's somebody in Arkansas who seems just as qualified as this person in San Francisco, and I can pay them, you know, 
75 or 60 percent of what I need to pay someone in San Francisco. And they're still, even with that location adjustment, they're probably still able to live at a little bit of a higher quality of life there than they would in one of these big major metropolises. So it's, it's, you know, being able to offer that flexibility to your employees and then be able to recruit globally. And you're also not competing locally either. So I think some of those benefits, um, which are a little bit more hard to quantify, but yeah, you just have a lower operating structure. And, you know, think about with this pandemic, if you were already distributed, you didn't have to go through any of the pain of switching to remote work. And I think now every business kind of has to say, what's our pandemic response plan? You know, how do we, how do we prepare for the next one? There's a lot of correlations between this issue and I think of September 11th, where you had a very terrible um, thing happen that really shut things down for a significant amount of time. And businesses had to come out with a with really clear response plans for the next time something like that would happen, like a terrorist attack, um, continuity plans. And so if you are distributed, then you really don't need to have that kind of continuity plan um, for any kind of like shutdown where we can't go into the office or something. Pulling on that thread a little bit, um, kind of pandemic, broader shifts. You and the team have done quite a bit of work on uh, impacts of COVID-19 and accelerations in many cases of the emerging tech adoption um, or you know, comfort levels. Maybe you can hit just some of the, the key points from some of the other research the analysts and the team have, have done around this. Yeah, I mean, so we, we cover a broad... Um you know, set of verticals from mobility to health tech to infosec and um, fintech. And so, you know, everybody's been writing about the impacts to their space. And I think, you know, where we've gotten a lot of interest is in a lot of our kind of health health tech coverage, especially of late. We had one of our analysts talking about, you know, the changing fitness environment. People aren't going to the gym right now. You need some way to work out at, at home. Uh, work out remotely and and you you know we saw Peloton report their report their earnings uh, last week and I mean really just kind of blowing numbers away. There's there's a, a number of venture backed startups um, like Tonal and Hydro that have these similar you know connected indoor in house gyms. So there's definitely a lot of interest there. A lot of interest in apps that can help you like potentially find a you know a workout class or an instructor. Or you know maybe a kind of mental health type of thing, so that that kind of you know fitness angle I think is very popular right now. You know there's a lot of attention there. Health tech in general, like anything related to telemedicine, is another area that we've been paying a lot of attention to. Um, delivery, obviously, there's kind of the initial response of everybody's going to start delivering things more, and now that we've gotten a couple months into this, you start to hear more and read more about what these industries are actually, what what these delivery apps are actually uh, investing in and how they're preparing for, you know, what could be a real permanent sort of step function up in demand and how they're adjusting to that. Um, so that part of it's, I think, also very, you know, very interesting. The fintech angle of it, you know, everyone has a Robinhood account. So, you know, I'm thinking a lot about from an enterprise perspective, just the emergence of all these new remote working tools. Like I mentioned, things like Miro and um, group designing, virtual collaboration tools, you know, like, like a Zoom, but there's a lot of things that look like Zoom. There's a new app called Clubhouse floating around that I think it's invite only at this point, but allows you to sort of drop in on people's, um, you know, audio conversations, kind of like a Twitch for audio type of a thing. Uh, Nothing so there, could I mean, go there's... wrong there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> probably a lot will go wrong there yeah, but you know yeah. we'll just kind of wait for it to happen that's sort of what happens with social apps but uh but yeah i mean i mean so there's in the in the sort of virtual technology space and then even in the physical at home space there's there's a lot of demand shifting in different directions and you know as painful as it is for kind of traditional retail um industries that have to you know close down or just see their traffic totally drop off um consumer demand is going in new places. And so that's kind of what we're just trying to track. Uh, what is next on tap for the emerging tech team? Uh, we have an analyst <laughs> that's actually doing a lot more work on the delivery space and kind of outlining, um, you know, providing sort of a view of what is the long-term impact here. We, we know that a lot of people are doing delivery. 
you know, how much of that maybe goes away when, when things start opening up again and how many kind of late adopters have we brought into the fold? You know, grocery delivery is largely young people. Uh, but in this environment um, where seniors seem to be potentially more at risk, uh, they could be, that could be a catalyst to really opening up the market and expanding it in you know, new significant ways. So, you know, that's a, a piece of research we have coming out. We have an analyst who's launching uh, new coverage on our AI vertical and um ai is very interesting too because i think with with companies moving remotely and trying to work uh in these distributed environments they need ways to automate the the processes they have more efficiently you know ways that they can keep track of systems and processes that need to get done and that means more sort of basic simple automation of tasks and oftentimes that means more ai more things like robotics process information or robotics process uh automation sorry you know, the AI space, I think, is coming under a microscope. I don't think there's anything here that's like made AI better. It's just the demand for it is increasing. So like, it's interesting too to think about how just because you have demand for more technology, it doesn't necessarily mean the technology gets better quicker. Right. Uh, it just this is all going to be sooner. Skynet by the time this is over. <laughs> We're all going to be run by Skynet. <laughs> I, it's Yeah, you know, very, very possible, I suppose. Um. Well, Paul, uh, thank you for joining us today. And uh, we'll certainly look forward to when you guys come out with those next analyst notes. And as always, you can go to pitchbook.com slash podcasts for the show notes and other relevant materials. I'm Adam Lewis. And I'm Adley Bowden. Thanks again for listening to this episode of PitchBook's Invisible Capital Podcast. Invisible Capital Podcast.